a tremendous challenge with the face-to-face -face classes. We suck at face-to-face -face classes, and now we want to make them bigger. That's brilliant. <laughs> that is just brilliant. But the reason why is, is totally economic. Uh, let's look at that here. So here, for example, is a graph. The blue graph shows you what I'll call uh, teaching quality. It's an instructor-student ratio. And of course, as you have more students, the student-teacher ratio is going to decrease. And in fact, I'll say that you know these people in here, about the time you get to about 50 students or so, maybe even about 80 students or so, uh, this is the we suck zone here. <laughs> yeah. The university is simply taking advantage of the students. We're going to tweet something, tweet that we are taking advantage of our students at the universities. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Amen. We are now teaching large classes. And the reason we're teaching those large classes is not because they're excellent for the students, but because they're so sweet for the university. Over here, the, number, the income per student is going up dramatically as you go up above 80 students. So we are simply being greedy so that we can teach the large classes, make our money there so we faculty can go teach those designer courses we really want to be teaching for the graduate students and upper level students here that we like to teach about because that's our field. There's a dis disparity here between the students then taking the large classes and, and those taking the, the small classes where they do get the kind of student teacher time they should be getting. <laughs> okay, first of all, I'm the answer all charges. All right. uh, any questions? Yes, you in the back. No, we're not answering that. Okay. Uh, anyway, just uh, you know, I was on my way to Memphis for uh, you know shop, and I got wired the wrong way, you know, so I ended up here. But uh, it's just a beautiful city. I'm glad to be here and uh, say hello to all these beautiful folks and everything. <laughs> You're good looking bunch. Uh, so, uh, so really, uh, till we meet again. Out in the snare, and so I face another by way. Well, <clears throat> well <laughs> you're gonna find these arrangements in, in the shop before. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but just they're, they're, not, they're not the same as they were back back in the day. I don't know, but. Uh, is there, is, there, is there a cafeteria around here at all? Because I'm actually getting a little bit of faint, and, and it's, uh, it is, it's, it's staying close to my shelf. Uh, Burger King. So I gotta, I'll, I'll make it work if my shelf to Burger King, ladies and gentlemen. I gotta go. We're a wonderful crowd, and uh, as we meet again, keep it on the road. Thank you very much. Stay good, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I've been teaching 33 years. <laughs> seven months and 16 days. <laughs> That's the worst. <laughs> Just, my career has hit a new bottom. <laughs> I don't know. I, Probably paid for by the university who doesn't like my message. <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> well, the place I was trying to go was if we could develop a thing. Oh, God, don't you? <laughs> Sing a song. Let's go. Ain't nothing but a home. All right. If, in, <laughs> if instead. If instead of these large cars, what if we could come up with the techniques, technologies, so that we could basically offer each student their own mentor? If we could come up with adaptive learning techniques so that each student would be getting more quality feedback, even in these large courses, then that, that model would come up with some cost that would, for each of those things. It comes up with a manageable cost, and basically your student-teacher ratio starts approaching one instead of those horrid numbers we saw a moment ago. So the whole goal here is for us to think about how we can use technology in the large class uh, to improve the teaching in the large class. So my own journey is this. Why would anybody in their right mind, we can, we can debate that now, <laughs> choose to create their own technology for class uh, must a desire to improve student engagement. Simple, simple as that. If you're in the large classroom, walk into the back of any large classroom on your campus and watch what's happening. Students are so disengaged. They're doing everything else under the sun. They are bored out of their minds. And you're offering them 
poor quality. I'd like to identify students at risk much earlier in the process. The software I'm going to show you, I'm going to know what, what students are doing within the first two weeks and which students are falling through the cracks long before the first exam. I would have hope at least to reach out to those students and bring them in, understand why are you not participating? What's going on? I wish to increase options for inclusiveness. I'm going to show you this technology levels the playing field. I would teach courses in science. And I will show you that women are less interested in asking or less confident about asking questions in my class. But with this technology, it turns out women are, women are now asking far more questions in class than the men are because we simply level the playing field, including more, more students. And if I don't create it, some fool in IT is going to do it for me. And I don't want that to happen. If these things ought to be created by the people who are actually going to stand in front of the students or be the students and use it the next day. And we have the responsibility to tell them how it should be done. And lastly, I have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> so I can do what I damn well please. <laughs> the technology we're, technology we're going to be using is called Lecture Tools. It's been evolving over about six years now at the University of Michigan. Um, and it's, it's like this, the students, uh, I as the instructor upload my PowerPoint or my keynote um, and then I have all the slides, like a slide tray of what I'm going to show in class now and then I can start adding the slides. This is the most valuable part. I'm going to pose questions to the students to see if they understand what I'm talking about. But more than what you can do with a clicker, I'm going to ask questions which include multiple choice free response questions image-based questions, numerical questions, rearranged list questions, a long list of question types you simply can't do with a clicker. And it takes advantage of a device they probably already have on their person. Plus, five years from now, really? We're going to ignore these technologies in the classroom? Every student's going to walk into class in five years with some device on their person that's internet-enabled. Am I right? When that happens, really, we're going to ignore that? That's stupid. So what we're trying to think here, what are the guardrails on that road as we move forward? How do we guide that development so that we take advantage of the pedagogical things we can with the technology? Certainly asking questions is part of that. I can import videos into this uh, presentation from YouTube of a wide range of sources. And now when the students leave class, they're going to have access to my slides, access to my questions, and access to the videos on their device. Uh, beyond all this, I can add polls, uh, and once I've got this in the system, it's sort of a content management. Now I can walk to any computer in the world and teach class. Or I can next semester just say click a button, it's going to bring these slides from last semester into my course, and I can rearrange them and edit them, of course, but I don't have to store all my slides and PowerPoint stuff and everything more. It's all in the cloud. This makes it very, very easy for me because I'm always forgetting to do where I put stuff. So here's a list of the things that uh, I'm, I'm pointing out here, the list of question types. This, the questions, from, this is hugely important. It offers the students the opportunity to ask me questions during class. And I'm going to get feedback from the students in real time during classes. I'm going to demonstrate as you, my students, are about to demonstrate. Here's a question type. Here's a uh, multiple choice question type. So this is from a professor teaching uh, political science who asked the question about the future of the sovereign state. I have no idea. I'm a meteorologist. But the students have clearly answered with B and C. You, when you create the question, you click a button, and the students then are going to, you can force the students to also tell you why they chose what they did. And now I can click on the letter B, here and it'll show me the justifications for the students who chose, for those who chose B. If I design the question right, I'm going to be able to uncover a lot of misconceptions through this process. The justification I'll argue is at least as valuable as how they voted here. Allowing them to see how they're thinking is equally important. Uh, and here's an example of a free response question. You note right away there are no names on here. You can, I'm asking, a, or this professor in kinesiology is asking a question. I have no idea what the right answer is, but she would. She's going to stand here and talk about this answer and say, this is, uh, this is missing a certain part. It wouldn't get full credit. This one is uh, incorrect. It's got, it said something wrong. Uh, this one is right. This one's dead on. You're giving the students something back. We are nothing more than vending machines. You know, and the student's putting you know, their change in, and they want that candy bar back from you. 
And so in this process, you're giving them feedback and during class of what, are, what am I looking for? What would be a correct answer? And this makes the class far more interactive than your normal large classroom. <clears throat> Here's, uh, oops, let me just move right past that for a moment for a reason. <laughs> it's time for you to be my students. You have devices in front of you. I've been watching you. <laughs> And just as you would in my class, I am now going to give you that spiel about you students. Uh, go to this website, myelectrotools.com. And when you do that, you're going to log in with the email address demo2933. Don't ask. I have no idea where that came from. Demo2933. No password is required. <laughs> Security guys, <laughs> I see you cringing. If, by the way, oh, uh, you are using an, uh, an iPad, uh, you'd want to go and download the Lecture Tools iPad app first and then do the same thing. Now, I'll give you a moment to do that as you're logging in. By the way, the instructions are going to be here on the bottom as well. And this will also give you, everybody who's watching, whether you're watching streaming or you're here, access to the slides. So you'll be able to uh, do as my students would do in class. And the information I have is at the bottom here, in case you didn't get it on the last slide, about how you log in to mylecturetools.com using this. And when you get to into it, you're going to see a button that says something like my enter first course or something, click that, and it should drop you into this lecture. It's just here, just here in the bottom. MyLectureTools.com and enter demo 2933. Now, as you come into this site, and I'm sorry, the, you know, the, the phone stuff isn't working so well yet. It's probably going to be problematic for you. It's going to get better really soon. It's perfect. God bless them. All right. <laughs> I'll buy you a beer. Um, so we're here now. And by the way, you'll see right away that for the student, you can see my slides now on the left-hand side of your window. And you can scroll through the slides. And that's hopefully valuable. But more importantly, this, everything I'm going to show you now, go, let me go back. The idea of making questions which are image-based was important to me as a meteorologist. That's why I made this. Everything else has happened since is because some student or some instructor came up and said, wow, what if we added this? What if we added that? So this is one of those organic processes, uh, software development, that's just come about because people who use it needed new things. One part of this, the students came up with right away is well, we want to be able to take notes, and the notes are then synchronized with the slides. And I encourage you just to write some, some words of notes. There's a reason for that. But be writing notes as we go along. And you'll be able to access this, by the way, after, cl after class, after lecture. <laughs> uh, as a student, not only can you write on the slides, you can draw on the slides. There's a little pen up here to pick a color. You can draw on the slides, and it's all annotation is kept in your, your set of notes. So that after class, you can see any annotations you've done. Uh, you can indicate up here in the upper left-hand corner, the star means this is an important thing. Perry is saying something important for a change. Step, put, put a star on it, and you're bookmarking the slide. So later, when you want to go back and filter through the slides, when you're down here to browse, you can filter through which ones that I think were important, and it helps you study. The upper, way upper left-hand corner is the flag. That flag means I'm lost. I'm confused. We call it the WTF button. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. And you click that button, and again, it marks the slide as being a place where you were confused, so you can study that later. At the same time, you can't see it, but it's sending a signal up to my screen here so I can see how many of you are confused at any moment. How about that? I know when students are confused. I still ignore it, but at least I know the students are confused. <laughs> <laughs> After 33 years, you pretty well know when they're going to be confused in class, right? So that's, and then the most important part up here is asking a question, and I encourage you to do this. Click the button, pose a question, and I, because I have 250 students, I've got a teaching assistant, thank God, sitting in the room who's answering these questions in real time in my classroom. Right now, I have a teaching assistant sitting in Ann Arbor, Michigan, We'll be answering your questions and doing spin control, what Perry says, 
during this presentation. So you can pose whatever questions you want to, and hopefully they won't be snide about me in their answers. And the beauty of that is when you pose the question here, when you pose the question, you're going to see the questions as they get answered. You're going to see the questions, and you're going to see the answers, but you're not going to see who asked the question. And that might seem simple, but that will end up being probably one of the more powerful parts of the system. Because now students are able to ask questions, fearful of being looking stupid in front of their peers. They can pose a question, get a response. It's made so women are asking more questions than ever before. We've gotten uh, international students for whom English is not the first language now feeling empowered to ask questions during class. And I'm getting far fewer students coming to office hours because they're able to ask the question when they had it during class and have an answer. And then we have, whoops, whoops, I know. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. I'm going to do something different here. Let's just kill that and go away and come here and do that. I don't really need to use PowerPoint anymore either, by the way. Now you can present with lecture tools, as I'll do here. And if you're using lecture tools uh, now in front of you, on slide 13, I pose a question to you that I'd like you to answer. You go to slide 13. By the way, you can click as many as you want to here. Who are you? What am I dealing with here? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Elvis is <the> E. <laughs> and we can show the results of this uh, as, it's, uh, as we're coming in here. So we have uh, <laughs> a bunch in the wrong meeting. Great. At least three uh, kindred spirits and instructors here. Anyway, this is typical. We can do a multiple choice kind of question. I don't ask you to justify or give you more information in this particular question. It just gives you a sense. You can do that kind of thing. By the way, importantly, if you didn't have technology and you, you can text your answers in using you know, you know, dumb phone texting, Likewise, if you don't have either of those things, just simply hand me, hand me your answers at the end of class, and I can add the credit for you participating. I give points for students to participate. So you don't need to worry enough so much about it being unequal among the class that anybody with any technology or without can participate. Next question. To demonstrate an image-based question, where do you call home? Hopefully it's on this area. If it's not, stick it off to the side. Put a dot on the map. Click that spot where you call home. And this illustrates how we might use, imagine this being an art class or, or, or anatomy class or meteorology class or whatever. I show weather maps. Where is the wind speed going to be strongest? And we see, we see a couple from Alberta, a lot from Ontario, and uh, Looks like Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia. You can get a sense anyway for the, how you can make this interactive in your own class for your own purposes. It's far different kinds of questions. How about this question? Class. <laughs> this is Hurricane Katrina. Now, by the way, as a professor uh, using this tool, I, I can also draw on the screen. This is a, oops, I can, I can draw on the screen. Uh, it just it'll will come it'll, it'll will come in a moment yeah oops why is it not doing it oh yeah and this so here's a here's a the hurricane is moving straight north where would you expect the greatest storm surge and again you can put a dot on the map think about it now in class invariably and let's just see what you guys do Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> This is not uncommon. Uh, and in class, I get roughly the same, the, roughly the same results, by the way, uh, where, where uh, there will be dots all over the place. And, uh, and I didn't mention before, any slides in my presentation I can hide. So those things I didn't want you to see, I can hide them. So here, by the same question asked in my class, where was the storm surge greatest? And you can see, this is after three days of discussing the physics of hurricanes. <laughs> 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 
this is a sobering moment. You know, again, the 30, 33 years, I would get done with lecture and ask, are there any questions? And invariably, no one would raise their hand. And I'd throw the chalk down and do the old victory dance thing. If I just nailed that lecture, they all got it. And then you do something like this, and you realize, oh my, all these years, I didn't know how little they understood. But this is the way I'm getting feedback. And, and yes, everybody laughs, and they realize, of course, you all, most of you, well, three of you knew, that the hurricane moves in a counterclockwise way. The storm is moving from the south to north, so the greatest storm surge should always be to the right of the motion of the hurricane. Yeah, there's a group here that didn't get it. <laughs> but they see that they didn't get it. They see that there are others who didn't get it. And that becomes a teachable moment, because it's not just me. And we can talk about it. Why would that be wrong to pick an area over here to the left where the winds are offshore? Another question for you. See if you've been listening. What kinds of questions? Again, you can click as many as apply. What kinds of questions does Lecture Tools offer? Again, so you want to keep testing your students. The more you interact with your students, the more engaged they're going to be. Here's the simple truth is in these large classes, we do not give students the opportunity to participate. This kind of tool gives the students the opportunity to participate, and they respond very strongly to that. Yes, thank you all. <laughs> Afterwards, then, uh, and then we're collecting this information about what the students are doing. So in this case, I know what students came to class. I know who asked questions. I know who got questions right when I asked questions. I know who participated. Uh, I know who, who indicated they were confused. And when Johnny walks up and says, Perry, I am trying so hard, I can pull up a sheet like this and go, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the look on their face when I do that. <laughs> Well, no, you're not. Uh, you, you could do more. And in fact, the system um, also gives me then a, a report card. In my 33 years, except for today, no one other instructor has ever walked into the classroom. No, I don't get any feedback about my teaching. In fact, I teach in engineering. I get one question a year about teaching. It's asked, did you hurt anyone? <laughs> Three years in a row, I haven't heard somebody, I get an award. <laughs> but this way, I'm getting feedback. And it says, well, today in class, 26 questions were asked. You got three you have yet to answer. And here are the slides the students found most confusing today. Now, I might not use that in real time during class, but for next class, I want to want to go back and cover some of that material. Well, here are the activities that I presented to the students. I can, I can drill down and see what they, how they answer these questions. Who attended class today? I get all kinds of data back from them that I have never had before, and this is exciting to me. And beyond that, just to give you a sense of where, I'm, where this is going, because this is always evolving. Everything I do is evolving. Um, let's just go quickly. I can go into my class. This is my class <clears throat> that ended a month or so ago. And what I started to do is mine. Remember they took notes? You were typing notes during class? I can mine the notes. And it's on every, for every day, these are all each lecture going back in time and seeing what they were reading. And here's a, the day for thunderstorms. I can drill down to that day for thunderstorms. And slide by slide, how many students took notes on a particular slide? How many words were typed? on this slide. How many students bookmarked the slide? Did they draw on the slide? And here are the words they were typing. We're starting to mine the data that coming from the students. And I think it's better. So inversion, if you're, you, you as a student get access to this as well. So I can go to that slide, click on the word inversion. It's going to start testing me to see if I understand that word. Is this great or what? You know what? But I don't have to tell them what to read anymore. I just come and blather on do class, ask questions, do the things I do. And afterwards, because of what they've taken for their notes, it's going to expose them to what's available uh, in, in, the, in the literature. And it's going to test them about these concepts. And if they don't understand the word, and let me just uh, click one of these guys here. Uh, I got it ain't wrong, so I click, it, click the word. And it, in my case, it opens up the, their electronic textbook to the page on which that word is discussed. 
so we can go much further now and start connecting the many resources that students use, both the note taking in class right through the resources they use outside of class. And if it's, they don't have it in the textbook, it'll take you to Wikipedia or YouTube or any number of other sources out there that you as the instructor might want to link them to. So it's possible when we start thinking about these data that we're collecting, I think is extremely exciting. Results from these, this more than just research, this is paid for by the National Science Foundation, God bless them, uh, over a period of years. What happens when you start using this kind of tool in class, I give a presentation as I did here, and something like 80% of students will now voluntarily bring technology to the classroom. Whereas in their other classes, maybe about 30% might bring it to every class. So there is a significant increase in the use of technology. And that immediately causes some heartburn for my colleagues, who are now worried that the students are going to go off and do everything else under the sun uh, during class time. So I've been researching that as well. And what we find is that the students, we ask them, I, I spend more time on tasks unrelated to class than uh, unrelated to class or lecture than in other classes because of using a laptop in the class. Well, they don't necessarily agree with that. I think they're lying. I mean, this is exactly why I take my laptop to faculty meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, you know. Unless they use the word Samson and salary in the same sentence, I've got things to do. <laughs> on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, when you pose this, now this is over like six years now of research. When, when we ask them, uh, use of laptop has increased my engagement in class. There's a, a the students agree. They feel more engaged. And it's not the technology. It's simply them giving them the opportunity to participate. And they will participate if you give them the opportunity. And we deserve to give them a better product than we're giving now in these large classes. Here's an interesting bit of research. Uh, before the semester began, I said that uh, when I have questions in a large lecture, I am comfortable asking them verbally during class. You can see that uh, uh, women, uh, they're less comfortable than men. They're less, com yes, strongly or somewhat disagree. They're less, they disagree. They're less comfortable asking questions in a large class compared to men. We'll be using lecture tools. Well, what happens is that more women actually ask questions than men. You're leveling the playing field. Everyone can have a voice in the classroom, whether you came in with fears or not. Likewise, the students who are, for whom English is not necessarily, their, or whatever I speak, is not necessarily their first language. <coughs> the last thought I have for you is, you know, thinking beyond this, and more than the face-to-face, -face, what happens when we start going larger? And uh, I'm, I'm, I like this face-to-face -face mobility. So I've already mentioned that I, with this technology, uh, which was purchased by Echo 360, God bless them, um, now I can teach class anywhere. I was in Tasmania two and a half months ago. I taught class live from Tasmania. I was in the UK a couple weeks ago. I taught class live from there. I don't need to be in class anymore. The students don't need to be in class anymore. With this system, I can broadcast as we could do here. And people sitting here everywhere can now answer my questions and ask questions, and we can have a dialogue. So, but it increases the quality of the course because we are having a dialogue. And there are two, I just, I threw up this one, splash top remote. That's one I found, and many like that out there, allow me to mirror what's on the screen with what's on my iPad. And when I do that, I can actually control the lecture tools, walk around the room, and if you're worried about your students going off task, and I'm standing behind you. <laughs> you're less likely to be going off task also. So it just gives me mobility in the classroom as well as mobility to move, move around the world, and that's exciting for me. And there's a variety of ways to do that, this face-to-screen courses uh, where, uh, you know, as I say, I have these classes, I give them extra credit to not come to class because I'm interested. Instead of a large class of 250, what if we had uh, 25 classes of 10 scattered all over campus? Some of you are going to sit in your pajamas at home. Fine. Is this is there any? Do you learn less? And that research is going on. And so far, I can report from last semester, the students who who watched from away got the same grades on average as the students who came to class. The only downside to it is for me as the instructor, when you tell a joke to 250 students, somebody might accidentally laugh. 
when you tell a joke to 25 students and the rest are gone, no one's going to laugh and you look pretty stupid. And there's in these slides, there's different ways. You're probably well aware of how to do this. You can broadcast using the Echo products. There's a wide range of ways to broadcast the class. The key here is as we're going to larger and larger classes, we must think about how do we improve the quality. And to almost no discussion, let's use Coursera, let's use Udacity, let's go bigger and bigger because there's money in it. That's just irresponsible leadership. At some point, we have to stand up and say, you know what, We're, we want to, you know, Ford you know, has to make good mufflers for their cars. We have to make a good product for our students, and we have to think about how to make these courses more interactive so students can participate. I'm... I got a, whoops, a video here, but I'm thinking that this, I don't have this plugged into your sound system. So is there a way to easily do that? I'm sorry, I forgot this step. Uh, <laughs> All right, does this work? Hello. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. This is makeshift. I apologize if it doesn't work. This is a colleague at the University of Michigan. Right here, and you can see a little square, and the classroom is completely different. What are we to do in the classroom that takes advantage of the bodies being in the room? I was frustrated by the lack of engagement in my big lecture class. With lecture tools, I started thinking, what do I want them to know right now? Not what do I want to be saying to them? What do I want them to know? So it changed my whole point of view. I took my PowerPoint slides, uploaded them, very simple to do. I'm often removing material from those slides and replacing it with an interactive activity because they have to engage with the material right now. What do you think about this? They're active with the material. They find out what they know, but they don't know. Then I can peek into their minds. I can see what they don't know. It's right there on the screen. Now we can talk about it. The more conventional technology is great. We put up a multiple choice question and students select one of the responses. But that didn't help me think now. Because what I want to do is show the questions and say, where on this image is the muscle? And the image takes questions where the students can interact with the image. That's everything for me. With such a visual Intensive course as an athlete. I can ask them about a particular muscle that they're still learning with a few response. They may have bad problems. I love that because I can see right where they're thinking. They can get rewarded for partial learning, for diving in. Material. It's activating them instead of teaching them. It's learning. It changes everything. Sharing the material, the conversation about the material, which is joyful. And much more interesting today. All right, thank you. There. Right, let me just also. Someone is bound to ask about the, the technology, what it what it costs, and such. And I'm clearly not the business guy here, but I can tell you that and uh, that if you like this. Um, and you go and click this button on lecturetools.com, the like button, that we have an announcement coming out in July that you're going to want to hear about. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm allowed to say. But I will tell you it's well worth your while, well worth your while to click that button. <laughs> Questions, please. Sure. Do you have any LMS integrations that go with, like, in Lecture Tools? Thank you. Yes, yeah, well, so many things I'm supposed to say. I'm not good at this. Um, yes, this, this is integrated through LTI with any anything that does LTI. Uh, and you just, uh, a button winds up in your LMS, they click the button, and, and they're single sign-on back into our system. And, uh, and I didn't show it and should have. There's a button on the, on the analytics page so you just click the button and upload the grades back into the LMS. All right? <coughs> Sir. So for students that don't have a device, and I assume that you can't get course people out of a device, 
have you done any measurement where they're actually picking up a bit more? Because, I mean, students without, for whatever reason, they just don't have advice. There are students, there are, there are 5% in Michigan who don't, don't have a device. And there are another 5% of the students who would prefer not to bring a device. And those students can hand in their results on a piece of paper and we give them the credit. Uh, their grades are no different than anybody else in the class. And likewise, we're also asked students, are you, do you feel like you're disadvantaged somehow by not having this technology? And the answer is no. I have some great videos of tornado chasing, but oh, <laughs> questions. questions here. Okay, how is this different from um, Top Hat Monocle? I don't know Top Hat Monocle. Uh, I think that's out of Canada, so I'm hoping you knew <laughs> how it might may or may not be different. Uh, second question, you know, I cannot. Second, third question, <laughs> uh, privacy policies. Uh, all the data that comes into the system is only accessible by the instructor, uh, as one would expect, like all data we take in class. It's never released to anyone else. It, and only in summary form to know, you know how many users there are to administrators of the campus. We might let them know that, but for the, we keep the data very private uh, and away from prying eyes. Uh, when the rain, if the rain if the rain stops, I will take credit for that. <laughs> yes, please. I don't know. I, I think that's a big issue. I know in BC at least, and probably more. Yeah. Um, I believe it's stored in. Uh, we use Amazon uh, cloud service uh, and Rackspace cloud service, and where physically it's stored, I'm not. Privy to, I think. I, I guess it's probably. Well, we are. I mean, we know we have servers in Australia. We have servers in the UK. Uh, if we need servers in Canada, well, I can sure. I don't do it, so sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Click the like button. <laughs> R? Hmm? R? R? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I can say that. Yes, the, uh, coming, coming soon, uh, uh, what a slide is is going to be changing. It's more than just a static image. It's going to be a video. It's going to be a web page. That area of slide could be a textbook. It could be Video, I mean, this could be, it will be many things. And, and so click, clicking through is one of the options. And that's coming really soon, in fact. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, a person with fair play certainly has a body with a level of documents that I know. I recognize the numbers in the room here, and we're all producing it from the same choir. And a major reason why stuff like this, I'm sure, works so often is your app. And when you showed that clip on that other instructor, that other instructor needed something to drag her out of the doldrums and have an exciting experience in class. She took action. I'm just doing that. The biggest challenge that I see we face is that we don't have technology to do this. But how do we talk to the, the, those that are kind of the deadheads and get a little more serious uh, on board with the kind of things you're saying? Well, we should be ashamed of the fact that, that there's so little attention to those. That, that's really, how do we get? I mean, this is what you're doing. Well, uh, th thank you, first of all, but you, you've hit it on the head. Now, there are two, couple, I'll offer two solutions. One, one is uh, uh, administrators uh, get enough backbone to say, you know what, we're going to raise the bar in these classes, and you, you need to participate in a new way. And maybe it's this, and maybe it's some other product, but somehow you got to take, if you're going to teach these large classes, then they need to be taught in a new way that offers more participation. That would be one possibility. That's not going to happen. It required backbone. So the second one, <laughs> the second one, the one I'm, uh, is it comes down to marketing. Again, being meteorologist, I know nothing about marketing. Um, so it won't stop me, however. So what I started to do uh, at Michigan and, and at Ohio State and Michigan State, other places, is we started gathering faculty uh, and offering them incentive. 
Um, we, <laughs> we call them lecture keggers. And the faculty, out of humor, would come to that. And then, in fact, what happened was that so many wanted to come to it that they couldn't come. Uh, and so we actually had it also offered online. I went out and we own the name Keganar. <laughs> and now we're offering Keganars online for the faculty who, who can bring your own bottle <laughs> and want to participate. And, and it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, faculty to faculty. I think that's what it's about here is, I, you know, I've got a child, I've got that tenure thing. And it's my responsibility to chide my colleagues into doing more. And I think everybody, we who do that on campus should be uh, uh, encouraged. We who have tenure and especially the senior faculty have the responsibility, I'd say, to speak to their fa faculty and ask them, force them, push them towards raising the bar in those classrooms. Uh, it's always going to be more conducive or more mm, a stronger sell if my colleague is doing it. Then if uh, some vendor walks in the door and says, you ought to be doing this, you know, fine. But if my colleague is doing it and showing that it works, then it's a far greater uh, likelihood that I'm going to do that. Somehow we, we need those senior faculty to stand up and start taking some pride in, in what we're doing. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. I would be happy, and by the way, I should say that we offer webinars to any school, any time, uh, to help you understand how to do this. It, the average learning curve is about 20 minutes, seriously. I mean, there's a button, you, if you have your PowerPoints, you just you know, click the button, add the PowerPoint, and your slides are, are into the system. The challenging part, as with using any student response system, is designing the questions uh, and designing good questions. What you really want to do is find a question where you need about 30% get it right the first time. This has also built into the possibility that when that happens, then you can show the results or not and say, all right, break into teams and now debate your answer with each other because students learn uh, more from each other probably than they do from you. So I give them the opportunity to talk to each talk to each other and hear from each other an explanation in their own language. Um, then you can come back and show how the results change as part of that process. The next question I'm likely to get is then how does it change the amount of material you cover in class? And what you're going to teach less. There's no no doubt about that, and it's okay. Tell your colleagues it's okay because you're just trying to cover, you know, just trying to cover your entire field because you're so proud of your field. You, you have to talk about everything in your field uh, at a, an inch deep instead of focusing on some time. I teach this course extreme weather. They're not going to be meteorologists. God forbid. We don't need that many more meteorologists. But I want them to be able to walk out and be ex excited about meteorology and be excited about climate and climate change and be informed enough to be, have an uh, uh, intelligent conversation. And to do that, it's more important that I get them to delve into maybe a few points along the course of the semester than trying to cover everything, rainbows and the whole kit and caboodle, of what's in my field. It just takes a change in mindset to offer a better education, I think. Forever. Now, the beauty of this also is going to be maybe if you have this throughout your entire uh, tenure at the university, a student tenure at the university, uh, in your third year, you had a question about Coriolis force. It'll it'll go out back and find the notes you had in your first year or second year in a different course altogether. So it's going to start to tie together your notes in one place, so you could look at how that progresses over time. Well, that's a good question. I was thinking university account, but if university account went away, we'll have to think of a way to allow them to continue to have access to that. Sure. Again, I don't do it, so sure. This is it. The ideas should come from the people who are going to, you know, who work with students. All right, I'm sorry, you're out. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.